Last week, we began an examination of the unity of the scriptures. We're talking about many writers, yet one uniform message with the theme and the purpose being to proclaim Christ and salvation in Christ. And that message and that theme runs concurrent from the old to the new in how God was going to bring out the Bible. Last week, we finished up looking at the law that God gave Adam and Eve when he placed them in the Garden of Eden, told them they could eat of all the trees of the garden, except the one that was in the midst of the garden, in verse 16 and 17, and they were told that if they ate of it, they would die that day. Well, they were tempted in Genesis 3 and verse 6, and they fell from suspect to sin and committed sin, and thus they died spiritually that day because they violated God's word. When they violated God's word, then they were in need of a savior. They were in need for redemption. They needed a remedy. They needed to do something that would bring sinful man and God back together to get in a relationship. And that can only be accomplished through the purest sinless sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Now, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we also sin. We're just like Adam and Eve that we sin. We may sin in different ways, but we sin too. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so that puts us all in a spiritual dilemma. That puts us at a spiritual risk. That we are guilty of sin. We have committed sin. And God knew that even though we've sinned, we would need a remedy in order to overcome our sin. Well, God provided that remedy through Jesus Christ, His Son. And so, even though we've all sinned, that's not a death sentence. That's not, fi that's not finality. We can overcome that sin, but we can only overcome it by obedience, by obedience to the gospel of Christ. In Genesis 3.15, God promised to send a Savior just for that very thing. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There was going to be conflict between the, the seed of woman and, and the serpent. There was going to be enmity between the seed and between the serpent. And that enmity would be seen in the hatred that the serpent would have for God. And everything that God loves, Satan hates. And every good thing that God wants to do, Satan wants to undo it. And so we have all of us in this predicament but God promised to put enmity. He promised to do something to bring sinful man back in line with him again. And that would be accomplished by the death of his son upon the cross. Excuse me. Savior comes from, Adam, from Abraham. Excuse me. From Abraham. And in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12, verse number 3. Abraham, who would uh, be the beginning of the nation of Israel, and Israel would lead us to Christ Jesus. And again, what we see is the Savior comes from the lineage of Abraham. We see that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 through 29. And so, Jesus is in the lineage of Abraham. He's the spiritual seed of Abraham in order to bring redemption about for sinful men. And the Old Testament was that the Savior is coming that there's something on the horizon, there's something that's coming. God understands our plight, God understands that we're knee-deep, so to speak, in the sin. And He knows we're drowning, we're floundering, and we need hope, and we need something that brings real change and erase that sin and bring us back into that relationship with our Father. Well, God understood that. And so, the fact that we sin, that illustrated that we need a Savior. And the Savior has come. Four gospel accounts proclaim Jesus Christ is the Savior, and he has come. One story by the four authors with four themes and four audience. Matthew writ written mostly to the Jews to tell them and to explain to them that Jesus was the prophet of Messiah. He was the Messiah of prophecy. The things that were contained in the scriptures about the Messiah were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It was also written to the Romans to show them that their hope lied in Christ too. Not like the Jews, but like the Gentiles, they needed to seek to have a relationship with Christ. And then you have four authors with four themes for four audiences. And you have John that dealt with the question of the deity of Christ, 
whether or not he truly was the Son of God when he was upon the earth. Of course he was. And then you have the Gospel of Matthew written mostly to the Jew and Mark written to the Gentile. And so God addressed the concerns and the teachings that he wanted to pass on to man through the work of the Holy Spirit. In the first four Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus Christ, the Savior, has come. It's the theme of Galatians 2. Israel, Messiah, the King, the Savior of all men, and the Jews, which his book is mainly written to, all of that demonstrates that God had a plan. And the ideal Son of Man, serpent the Savior of all men, and Mark, would say that he had done, he had lived a long good concert before men to this day, and if he'd taken anything wrongfully, that he needed to be punished for it. But again, nothing was coming because he was a righteous man. And so you have the author, you have the, the books, and the theme, and the readers, and in the first century, you had the church as it was beginning its infancy. Well, An ideal son of man, great physician, friend of sinners, savior of all men. He mainly appealed to the Greek, that he was a Gentile. John, God in the flesh, savior of all men. He was a Gentile. And he demonstrated in the book of John that Jesus was indeed who he claimed to be, that he was the son of God. In the last book that bears his name in the gospel, John, he wrote this in first number uh, Verse number uh, 30, excuse me, verse number 20 of chapter 21. Then Peter turning around saw his disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had laid on his breast at the supper. And he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this praying, saying, went out among the brethren, that his disciples would not die. And Jesus did not say they would not die, but I will, I will that he remain till I come back to tell you what God has in store for you. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are many other things that Jesus did which are not written one by one, I suppose even the world itself cannot contain the book that would have to be written to compile everything that Jesus said and did. But he revealed much of it, and he revealed much of it in order that we might know what we need to do, how we need to do it, and how God expects us to live our lives to be the example of influence for good. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's the theme of the entire body, from Genesis to Malachi and Malachi to Matthew. Old Testament, the message is he's coming. The four gospel record in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John explains that he has come. He has come and come back to Palestine. And then Acts and the epistles, he will come again. He will come again, but he will come for a very different purpose. He will come apart for salvation, but for destruction of those who do not know him. And so the Savior has come, and in the Old Testament the message is that he's coming, in the four Gospels is that he has come, and in the Epistle of John and other charismatic people, and people that lean upon the uh, false assumption, excuse me, false assumption that, that God's not real and God's not going to destroy anybody and everybody's going to get to heaven. Well, the Bible just doesn't bear that up. And then you have the Acts and the Epistles. He will come again. These make reference to his coming again, coming to judge and coming to redeem his own. And so these things are going to happen, but the Savior and the subject matter are contained in the New Testament, just like there are things that are peculiar to um, the Old Testament. There are things that are thoroughly covered in the New Testament. Testament, and it should give us great hope and confidence that this word indeed is true. The 
Sinners can be reconciled to God. Man alienated from God, tree of life lost, physical death, and death reigns. Yes, that's all true. Man is still dying. Man is alienating himself from God. He's lost access to the tree of life. And his physical death is, is very close. It's not very far away. But that's the bad news. But the good news is that you can still have a relationship with Christ and you can still be faithful if you listen to the things that are being taught and make the right recommendations and accommodations in your life and you too can turn your life around in a spiritual way. So he drove out the man and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. See, even after God told them not to go out there, they had to, they had to check for themselves. When he told them not to go out there and not to eat of that tree, but again, they doubted God. And again, they paid a very stiff price. When they did, they were lost. Sinners can be reconciled to God. Revelation 2 verse 2 teaches that. Also, chapter 22, the first two verses. Man is reconciled to God, and the tree of life will restore it in heaven whenever he resubmits those things in order to receive the blessing. And he showed me a pure river of water, water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne and the God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree and yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. And so man reconciled to God, and the tree of life is restored in heaven. The tree of life comes back to heaven. And again, you want to remember that the tree of life was a tree of life was a place where man could protect him and he could live forever. But when man sinned, God held access to the tree of life, and now he can't sin, uh, he can't live forever in heaven. But he can still live forever in heaven with God and the saints if he is found faithful on the day of judgment. All the new lives harmonized in Acts 17 11. Animal sacrifices were made, and temporary atonement for sin was granted. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your soul. It is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. And so the saving blood of Christ made atonement. It made atonement for sin. It made atonement and a payment for the sin that had been committed that put their souls in jeopardy. And so, again, this is something that God feels very strongly about. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, God prepared his people for a new and better covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I, I will remember no more. Again, it's an assurance by by are proud of it that he wants to forgive, but we're going to have to seek that forgiveness. We're going to have to desire it, and then we're going to have to do the things that are necessary in order to obtain it. We also see here that the old and new laws don't contradict, they harmonize. Christ fulfilled the purpose of the old law. He offered a perfect sacrifice. He offered his own body as a perfect sacrifice pay the ransom price for sin, to pay the remedy that was so only needed by man that he couldn't pay for himself. God made a provision. He made a provision in order to bring about sinful man back to his side. Then he said to him, Behold, I have come to you to do your will, O God. He takes away the first and he may establish the second. By what will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all? Now again, this passage is saying that the purpose of the old law 
was fulfilling Christ Jesus. He was the means of fulfilling all that the law had written concerning him. And so again, when that was done, then it would give the need that that law could be set aside. In Hebrews 8, verse 6, as the new high priest, he inaugurated a new company. Now he's obtained a more excellent ministry, insomuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. And that has reference to the Old Testament. And so in the Old Testament, they had a mediator, they had a better covenant. Even though they had these things under the old law, they weren't as good and weren't as uh, powerful as they are under the new covenant. And so again, this is just referring that there is a new covenant. If it's new, that means the old one is obsolete. There are not two covenants, there are one. The old law and its covenant have been set aside, but the one that now judges us and the one that we must adhere to is this one built on better promises. Christians are priests in the new temple, and that new temple is the church point of Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim in the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Therefore I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, to stay from flesh and lust, which war against the soul. Again, Christians are encouraged and, and by the new priest in the new temple to come in, and that temple is the church. And you can read that in Acts chapter 10, and about verse 38. And so we see that God had a plan. He had a plan, and Christians were priests in the new temple, and in the church, you can go and make your own cake. You can offer your own uh, prayer. You can do it yourself. Because why? Because God gave you the ability. We just have to know the value of what we're living and the value of to where we're going. And if we don't understand that, we're going to make some pretty bad decisions. And so we must recognize that the more information we have, the better a solution can be found. Divine doctrine harmonizes with human doctrine, but you see, divine doctrine harmonizes. It's in agreement. It doesn't contradict, it doesn't get out of sync. But human philosophy, human doctrine, human teaching, they contradict. Why? Because they trip over their feet. Because they don't know what the right hand or the left one's doing. And they make arguments that can't be substantiated by the evidence. Therefore, it is a false teaching. Old method is discipline. Babies are born in sin. No, they're not. We sin when we fall into sin, when we give in, when we yield to sin. Well, the the uh, due to discipline, the babies are, are not babies not born in sin. Now they're saying that some babies are not born in sin. The old Presbyterian creed opposes evolution, but the new creed accepts evolution. Again, it's ever changing. It doesn't stay constant. Churches oppose immorality now accept it. Concerning adults, alternative lifestyle, alternative movies. You see, man's changed his understanding. He's changed his concept. He no longer wants to be led and guided and be responsible for the law of God. He wants to do his own thing. And so he's evolved to go in many different directions. But the problem is, that doesn't change God's law. Even though he could go in a different direction, that won't change the things that God teaches him in his word and the things that he is responsible by God to take care of. And so he's got to take care of that. And he can only take care of it by being obedient to his will. You see, the divine doctrine will always harmonize. It's not going to contradict. It's not going to double talk. It's not going to say one thing here and another thing here. But human doctrines, they always conflict. They always conflict. Why? Because they're inaccurate. Because they're not true. Therefore, we must have confidence that the divine is superior to the human. Now, in Galatians 1.8, this is an unchanging gospel message. But even if we are an angel from heaven, 
preach any other gospel than that which we preach, we need to make, let him be accursed. We need to understand that there is no other message. There is no other message that can give man life. There is no other message forthcoming from God. If you want to know what to do to be saved, you're going to have to look in this book. If you're going to want to know how to organize a church, you're going to have to look in this book. If you want to know how to worship God correctly, you're going to have to look in this book. And if you want to know what your responsibility is to your wife, to your husband, to your children, their responsibility to you, you're going to have to look within the pages of this word. Why? Because there is no other message. There is no other message that's vital except the words that are contained in the Bible. And so, God guide the Bible writers to unity in purpose and in theme. This book is about how to bring sinful man back into a relationship with his creator and how what God would do in order to bring that about. And God protected and spread the scriptures and no man can destroy it. He can disagree with it. He might not like it. He might not live by it. He might not obey it. That's his prerogative. But he will never be able to destroy it because it will always be here to face him in judgment. And the Bible's perfect unity and harmony are evidence that God's work is behind it. You couldn't get ten people to write about the same subject and all come up with the same words and the same thoughts and have them organized in the same way. It just wouldn't happen. It's not possible. But it did happen here, and the reason it happened, even though it was over hundreds of years, was because they were guided by the Holy Spirit. So they would have perfect unity and harmony. That's why they have perfect unity and harmony. Because they were guided by the things they taught, by the scripture, by the word of God. And so what we need to see as we bring this particular lesson to a close is understand, ladies and gentlemen, that there were 40 different individuals that wrote the Bible. They wrote at different times. They wrote under different circumstances. They never met. They never conferred. They lived in different dispensations of time. They came from different cultural backgrounds came from different educational backgrounds, and some of them were educated, some of them were not. But God used all those 40 writers to bring about a unified, harmonious theme and message that could bring people closer to the cross and to lead them to salvation if they would be obedient to God. And so God had this plan, and he had it before the world began. But when you and I read the scriptures, when we open up the pages of God's book, and we begin to examine his teaching, and we begin to look at his message, we can have full confidence that that message is true, that that message came from God. And if we do the things that that message teaches us to do, then we're going to be found pleasing in his sight. But why can you and I have that kind of confidence? Because this book has perfect unity and harmony. You're not going to see Daniel disagreeing with Jeremiah. You're not going to see Moses disagreeing with Paul. You're not going to see Jeremiah disagreeing with Peter. It's not going to happen. Their messages are going to be in harmony. There will be no contradiction. There will be no uh, fighting one with another and with one writer saying one thing and another saying something completely opposite. That's not going to happen because God had his handprint on this work when he sent the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth, in their thoughts, in their words. They were guided by God. God revealed what he wanted man to know. Now, did he tell us everything we need to know? No. Did he, yes, excuse me, he did tell us everything we need to know. Did he tell us everything we want to know? No. Are there some things he left out? Yes, and for whatever reason he did it, there was a reason. And we must accept that and we must not question him about that because he did it in his infinite wisdom because that was best for us. But what you and I have to come to grips with, and what you and I need to really think about today, is how could this book have no contradictions, have a major theme where that theme is Jesus Christ, salvation in Christ, and that is perfect harmony and unity with every person that wrote it, beginning with Moses and ending with John. All of the Bible was written in a way that clearly expresses the message that God designed before the world began. And so the question begs to be asked. If that book has complete harmony and unity, and it does, and it tells us how to bring sinful man back into relationship with his creator, then why don't more people read it, study it, 
believe it, and most of all, obey it. And the question, and the answer, real answer is, is they don't believe it. They don't believe it's the Word of God. They don't believe in its validity. They don't believe it doesn't contradict. They believe what the pundits say. They believe what the enemies of the cross say. They believe it and accept it without personal examination. That's not a very wise thing to do. We need to look at the evidence. We need to ponder it. We need to pray about it. We need to think about it. And we need to think in our mind, how could 40 men over a period of 1,500 years, never meeting, never converting, different educational backgrounds, raised under different cultures, spoke different languages, were educated different levels, but all of their messages flow in a very peaceful, harmonious, and uncontradictory way throughout the whole pages of God's Word. And the central theme of the Bible is salvation in Jesus Christ. You could break down the Bible into three messages. The Savior is coming. The Savior is here. Then the Savior is coming back again. We've already spent and done the first two. And just like the first two happened, the third will happen also. He's coming back, but he's not coming to establish a kingdom. He's not coming to establish a thousand year reign upon the earth. He's not coming in order to establish some earthly kingdom where he'll rule and reign for a thousand days. Oh, that's wishful thinking. That's the doctrines of men. That's the philosophies of men. And that's contrary to God's word. What God said he will do is come to destroy this world and to judge man and to give the faithful the reward and to punish the wicked. Now, do you believe it? If you do believe it, then understand that this book has a purpose, it has a theme, and it has perfect unity, and it has perfect harmony. And all God wants you to do is to read it, study it, meditate upon it, and accept its findings, and do more than just accept it, but obey it in your life, and put it to work, that you might be pleasing in His sight, and when He comes again, He'll receive you as one of His faithful children. I want to thank you for listening to our broadcast this morning. We hope that you'll tune in again next Lord's Day, as we continue looking at some evidences of the Bible, and again, if you have any questions about anything you've heard, anything that we've taught in these lessons, or even some of the previous lessons, please don't hesitate to call us. We'll be glad to sit down with you with an open mind, an open mind, and come to us and the Lord. If you're in our area today, we would love to see you. You'll always be warmly received, and all we want you to do is come and study His Word with us and worship Him.